Good morning. Welcome to Our Redeemer. The Latin name for this Sunday of the church year is one word that means remember. But this is not like calling to mind fond memories. This is a demand that we would make of our God to remember us. And that's going to be the theme of our service today. We'll begin with the opening hymn, which is printed in the service folder. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake.
Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you see that we have no power to defend ourselves. Guard and keep us both outwardly and inwardly from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Jacob wrestles with God. These words will serve as the basis for the sermon this morning. Lesson from Genesis chapter 32. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore to this day the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. The word of the Lord. Oh 
God uses suffering in the lives of believers to produce a hope that will never disappoint. Lesson from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter. Please stand. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 15. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise you may be seated. to love. 
grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So what do you do when you discover that God is your adversary? I don't mean the Lord doling out just punishment over you for your sins. No, I mean when you peek behind the curtain and you find out, that as you look there, that the bitterest moments in your life were hand-delivered to you by God. I recognize that this does not square well with the sanitized view we have of the world where anything that bad that happens is dumped upon the devil or evil people and where God stands as some sort of cosmic therapist and we are all just trying to discern the Lord's plans for our lives. Well, take a look at the account of Jacob wrestling with God and discern the Lord's will for Jacob. What was it? It was to attack him. And that, at a moment when Jacob had been left all alone and there was no one else who would come and help him, and when Jacob was already scared out of his mind, sure that the next day would see the death if, or carrying off of his family, if not the spilling of his own blood upon the ground in a fresh fratricide that would be recorded in the books like a sequel to Cain and Abel. Jacob, in a word, was terrified. Let me refresh your memory as to how Jacob arrived at the ford of the Jabbok there where the Lord wrestled with him. Jacob you may recall, had a twin brother whose name was Esau. And even before these twins were born, they were at fisticuffs with one another. Scripture records how their mother cried out in pain because there was so much kicking and jostling inside her swollen pregnant belly. And that pattern persisted when the twins were born. Everyone saw it clearly. There were Jacob's little infant fingers, tiny wrapped around Esau's heel in a death lock as if to pull Esau back into the womb so that Jacob could get ahead and Jacob could be first. Jacob spent much of the rest of his life trying to accomplish that thing. He grew up in a rather dysfunctional family where mom and dad both played favorites, where mom was happy to scheme and manipulate and even deceive dad and She roped Jacob into the greatest deception of all when she had him pretend to be Esau and trick his poor blind father into blessing him, thinking that he was his brother. Well, naturally, this didn't sit well with Esau, but Esau was a sensible man, and he knew how to clear up a mixed-up blessing. It was really simple. He vowed to kill Jacob. And so Jacob had to leave his home and flee. And as he was fleeing, one night he laid his head down on a stone for a pillow. And you probably remember that that night he saw a vision. You remember the content of the vision, right? A ladder stretched from heaven to earth, the angels of God ascending and descending upon it. Today, though, I'd like you to recall and hold in your mind the content of the promise that the Lord spoke to Jacob that night. For in that vision, he said to Jacob, I am the Lord, I will be with you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this place. That was the promise that God made to Jacob as he fled. Well, Jacob fled, and he lived a few years with his uncle named Laban, who turned out to be an even better deceiver and trickster than Jacob himself. And when Jacob was finally fed up with that, He resolved to go home. And that's where our account picks up. Jacob, on his way home, Laban pursued him. Now he was drawing near to home, but home meant drawing near to Esau, his brother who, for all Jacob knew, was still intent on getting his hands around Jacob's neck to wring it once and for all. 
So Jacob made plans. He divided his wives and children into two groups, hoping that at least one of them could escape. He sent them across the ford of the Jabbok until Jacob was left all alone to spend a sleepless night tossing and turning and wondering what was going to happen the next day when he finally came face to face with Esau. And it's at this moment that suddenly a mysterious, ambiguous figure emerges from the dark and attacks Jacob. Don't think that Jacob knew that this was the Lord. He probably thought it was an assassin that Esau had sent, or, or at least a highway robber who was out to make some quick cash. And so as Jacob was there by himself on the other side of the river, all alone, he found himself that night literally fighting and clawing for his life. He had been attacked. And it seems to me that it's the ambiguities in life that are the real killer. When the attacks, so to speak, come, and it's not at all clear, we can't just pin it on some evil person or the devil's handiwork. So you have a young couple, recently married, and now they find out with great excitement that they are going to be welcoming a child into this world. But then, a miscarriage, and all of those hopes are lost. They try to pull a thin veil across with self-guilt. The mother-to-be grieving says, I shouldn't have eaten this or that. I shouldn't have taken that trip by airplane. But who are they really kidding? Hiding behind that curtain is the Lord, who in his unfathomable way has taken away from them a precious gift, a precious blessing. We talk about how things like depression and anxiety have the fingerprints of Satan all over them as he hounds and pushes people into the darkness to stare into the abyss, trying to get them to fall headlong into it. And that is all true, absolutely. But a woman who's overcome by anxiety, so much so that some days she can't hardly even get herself out of bed And her friends have all grown tired of hearing about her problems. They just avoid her. She thinks, at least I still have the Lord. But but in those moments when the feelings of anxiety are washing over her most strongly, and she cries out and she says, Lord, help, make it stop. There is just silence from heaven. Nothing happens. Nothing changes. The prayers don't make the situation better. God has turned his face from her. And we could go on down the list, whether it's the time in life when the finances have all gone haywire and you just want a plain, simple path forward, but there isn't one. Or when the the hurt of rejection sets in, The ache of loneliness afflicts you. The stabbing wounds of a broken relationship or a broken home don't let up. The specter of illness haunts over you. And in those moments, there is a chilling discovery that you make. The Lord's will for my life is somehow this. Add insult to injury and And prayer doesn't make the situation better. This is what happened to Jacob as the Lord came and attacked him. And and Jacob wrestled. He fought back. And that in itself is significant. I should state at this point that suffering, when it comes into our lives, is not in and of itself a good thing. It may just as likely produce atheism in the soul as it might draw someone closer to the Lord. In fact, I believe that more people are lost to our faith because of their own experience of the senseless suffering 
that takes place in this world than are lost because of clever, brainy arguments launched at them in a college classroom. It's what happens when you turn on the TV these days and see the horrible brutalities of war and you say, where is God in all of this? Where is God with all his goodness? Where is God when he pounces on you in the dark and you find yourself clawing and fighting for dear life? Jacob stayed. He didn't say, I'm done with you, Lord. He didn't run away. He didn't give up. No, what Jacob did was he fought back. And perhaps to his surprise, certainly to ours, he begins to prevail. The Lord, like a father play wrestling with his young son, doesn't use his full strength. He actually allows Jacob to start gaining the upper hand only once suggesting to him who it might be that Jacob is wrestling with as he reaches out a hand and touches his hip and with that touch puts Jacob's hip out of joint. Aha, a clue. Something that dawns on Jacob in his mind as he is fighting in this desperate struggle, convinced that he is going to be done in. Who is it that is wrestling with him? And there, by the fort of the Jabbok, the Lord forces Jacob to confront the promises that he had made to him long ago. I will be with you wherever you go. Could it be, Jacob wonders, could it be that the Lord is with me in this place at this moment, only under a form I never would have guessed as the adversary who pounced upon me in the darkness and tackled me and made me struggle for dear life. Could this be the Lord, the one who promised that he would bring me back to my home and that he would be with me wherever I went? At the beginning of the night, Jacob was sure he was dead meat. By the morning, he not only had been blessed, but he was in utter awe. I have seen the Lord face to face, and yet I live. And Jacob learned in that struggle, not only to fight back, but to hold on and to cry out in the midst of his adversity, I will not let you go until you bless me. So this brings me back to my original question, what do you do when you discover that God is your adversary? That the bitter moments in life have been hand-delivered to you by him? Well, you learn a lesson from Jacob. You don't turn and run away. You don't give up on God and let atheism settle into the soul. No, you fight back. You take hold of God by every promise that he has ever made to you, And you hold him to it and you demand that he should keep his word. And that as he has said, so it shall be done to you because he is the one who said it. A Canaanite woman did this, right? She heard through Jesus' answers that there was never a hard no, but but hidden there the promises of God, though he set his face against her. And she said, Lord, look at me, I am one of those lost sheep of the true Israel, not by blood, but the the Israel that is the Christian church. So hand me, dog that I am, just the crumbs that fall from your table. Jacob did it, holding on with a bear hug to the Lord who had attacked him and saying, no, you will not leave. Not until you pour your blessing out on me and show yourself to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the God of blessing, of mercy, the God of the promise that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through me. You do it too. When depression settles like a crushing heavy weight upon you or the frenetic waves of anxiety have you pinned to your bed, 
you cry out to God by the promises he has made to you. And you say, Lord, you have said that I am yours. You have claimed me and put your name upon me by my baptism where your water and your word touched my forehead and made me yours. And so I will believe your promise more than the feelings that I can't shake from my soul. This is reality. You have said you will be with me. I know that that is so. If the ache of loneliness or the stabbing pain of a broken relationship comes into your life, you find yourself by yourself, alone, no one who gets you, no one who can come to help you, And what do you do? You take hold of God's promises and you say, Lord, you have promised to be with me wherever I go. Faithful friend that you are. So so open my eyes to see that though I may have no one in this world, yet I have you. Let me see truth and reality that as you have promised, wherever two or three gather in your your name, there you are with them and, and that you unite yourself with me personally in your true body and blood to accompany me all the days of my life, to wash away the pain and and the wrecks in life that I have caused by my sin and that others have brought into this life by their sin. You have abandoned it all up and, and made it whole. So be with me now. When the grave with its icy fingers starts to reach out, and lay hold of one of your loved ones. Or you find yourself facing that final sleep in the dust of death. What do you do? You take hold of the promises that God has made and you say to him, Though you may slay me, Lord, yet I will trust in you. And as you have promised that you are resurrection and life, as you have told me that with these eyes I will see you face to face, So though I die, you will fulfill your word, O Lord, and raise me from the dust of death. And open these eyes that close. Open them again to see you face to face in your glory. So that I may walk in the land of the living. Lord, you have promised this. I will not let go of that promise. No, not until I see it for myself. Not until that day. Not until you keep your every promise. Friends, you know what I'm describing. And you know this, that Jacob, after his struggle, walked away that day with a limp. A reminder in the pain that he felt in his hip that he wasn't going to face Esau by his own cleverness or strength. That he wasn't going to pick his way through this life on his own. No, that limp was the reminder that kept Jacob humble and his eyes fixed on the Lord, the one who blesses. I have no doubt that you bear in your body, and if not in your body, then on your soul, the scars that are left over from some of the bitterest sufferings in your life. They are your godly limp, the thorn in your flesh, the reminder to you that everything depends on the promises of our God and of what you have discovered in those moments when he has set his face against you. Looking back on some of those bitter moments, don't you see that it was precisely then that the Lord drew closest to you and and you learned more about his love than you had ever imagined before. That hiding behind his adversarial face is a heart that is all grace and mercy all the way through and all for you. We who follow God, we all walk with a limp and we're better for it. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For all the baptized children of the Heavenly Father, that in their baptism they see themselves as redeemed, restored, and forgiven people of God, who though beggars are also kings and priests in Jesus Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the countries of the world, especially our country, and for all world leaders, that they might see their mandate to serve as a mandate of peace, justice, and kindness that flows from the Prince of Peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who suffer from addictions of all kinds, that they may be freed from vain idolatry and cling to Christ, who breaks through darkness and brings the light of everlasting life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick the suffering, the lonely, the forsaken, and all who desire to be heard before the throne of grace, that with boldness and confidence their cries of help are heard and answered according to your good and gracious will. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For those who have gone before us in the faith, especially those in our families, that we too may fall asleep in Jesus with the sure and certain hope of the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Please stand. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift, you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Once again, good morning to all of you. Uh, a joy to gather around God's word and his sacrament today with you. You're invited to stick around for our, our Bible study in the community room that will Get started at 9.15. Also want to highlight our Wednesday evening Lenten Vespers. Uh, 5.30 is when our congregation gathers for a meal. From 6 till 6.45, there's a, a Bible study. This year, we're looking at the Lord's Supper. And then 
at 7 o'clock. There's about a half an hour evening service, a Vesper service for our Lenten walk. Hope that, that, uh, that to see many of you on Wednesday evening. God's blessings to you as you go and, and serve your Lord this week.